All right, we're beginning Judith Jarvis Thompson's A Defense of Abortion. It's a philosophy article written in 1971 by Judith Jarvis Thompson, who is a professor of philosophy at MIT. Uh, I believe she's still alive. Uh, I believe she's emeritus. She's retired over at MIT. I see a picture of her there. This article is the most widely read, influential, and perhaps you might even say important philosophical article written on the ethics of abortion. More or less every serious uh, discussion of the ethics of abortion, serious sustained discussion of the ethics of abortion, say in a classroom or something like that, is going to bring in this article or the arguments from it. If you ever uh, read about the ethics of abortion in, in, in some other class, you will likely come across either this article itself or an idea or an argument from this um, article. The arguments are much stronger than the arguments in Roe versus Wade. And I think this is something uh, over which there's consensus. As little consensus as there is in the abortion debate, I think people would agree that this article uh, has much, much stronger arguments. Uh, so both pro-life and pro-choice people would agree. Um, <clears throat> the arguments, as we're going to see, uh, rely on thought experiments. And so they can be kind of um, uh, fantastical, if you will. They can be uh, a little out there. Um, we'll talk about why she does that. We'll talk about how the, uh, an, an argument that relies on thought experiments work um, in due course. Uh, but it's these arguments, these kind of fantastic scenarios that she um, creates. This is what the article is really uh, famous for. Um, a little bit of context for the uh, uh, article. So in general, the kind of first societal context and then a little kind of internal context in the article itself. So the societal context is written in 1971. This is two years before Roe versus Wade um, is, uh, comes out. And so there was a kind of, um, the very general context, there was a growing um, movement of which Judith Jarvis Thompson and her article have been a part, uh, a growing movement uh, to liberalize abortion laws. So there were abortion restrictions in place, for example, Texas is, uh, which more or less totally banned abortion, except when necessary to save the life of the mother. Right? That was Texas's law. That's what Roe versus Wade uh, uh, deemed unconstitutional. There was a growing movement prior to Roe versus Wade to start rolling back these laws. And so you can read Thompson's article in that context. So Thompson, uh, as you can tell from the title, is uh, would come down on the pro-choice side of things. She is going to defend the moral permissibility of abortion. Now, that being said, her view is actually fairly nuanced. And she never really directly, explicitly, clearly says uh, which abortions she thinks are morally permissible and which aren't and what's the difference. She clearly thinks that some abortions are morally permissible. And so that puts her on the pro-choice side of the issue. She clearly thinks also, however, that some abortions are morally impermissible. She gives us an example at the very end of her article. She says something like, uh, imagine you have a seven month, uh, a woman who's uh, in her seventh month of pregnancy and she wants to get an abortion merely to avoid having to replan some trip that she was going to take. Thompson says that would be indecent. That would be morally impermissible. By contrast, uh, you know, a teenager who um, gets pregnant, it's the second month of the pregnancy, clearly it'd be permissible for her to uh, procure an abortion, Thompson argues. Where exactly the line is, she doesn't say but uh, we'll talk about this in due course. The kind of internal context of the article that is important to 
wrap our minds around as we venture into it. The abortion debate, <clears throat> one of the central concerns of the abortion debate, and we saw this in Roe versus Wade, was this notion of personhood. And the way a lot of people, both pro-choice and pro-life, uh, approach the abortion issue is um, something like the following. Whether or not abortion is permissible or impermissible depends upon whether the fetus is a person. If the fetus is a person, abortion is morally impermissible. If the fetus is not a person, abortion is morally permissible. Right? These, this is a standard way of trying to think through the abortion issue. What's very, very interesting about Thompson's article is that she is going to argue that abortion is morally permissible even if the fetus is a person from the moment of conception. Even if the embryo, that single-celled um, uh, organism at the very moment of conception, even if we grant that, that, even if that thing is a person, nonetheless, a person with a, with a right to life, nonetheless, abortion is morally permissible, or so at least Thompson is going to argue. And <clears throat> now it's important to be clear what exactly she's doing. Thompson does not, in fact, think that the embryo is a person. But for the sake of argument, she's going to grant that it is, because this is something that people on the pro-life side of the issue often uh, maintain and argue for. Thompson is going to say, fine, I'll grant you that. I'll grant you for the sake of argument that from the moment of conception, we are dealing with a person. Nonetheless, she's going to argue, abortion is morally permissible. We're going to see how exactly that works, uh, because at the you know at first glance that might seem well. How could you possibly maintain that? I mean, if the if the embryo is a person, it's got a right to life. You can't abort it. We're going to see how exactly her argument works in due course. <clears throat> 